Greetings, everyone. My name is Karen Dove, and I am a volunteer with the Massachusetts MECFS and FM Association, and I will be your moderator for today's event. I would like to welcome you to our annual meeting and program today, featuring a very special guest and our keynote speaker, Dr. Dr. Anthony Komaroff. Dr. Komaroff's presentation is entitled MECFS and Long COVID, Emerging Similarities and Why It Matters. We're really thrilled that so many of you could join us today. As of this morning, we had 485 registrants for today's event, and it's been really fun to see everyone typing in the chat where they're calling in from. It looks like we have a lot of people calling in from all over, and I'd like to give a special welcome to our members, our volunteers, and our guests that are calling in from Massachusetts, uh, the rest of the United States, and um, from countries all around the globe. So thank you so much for being here. We will begin our program today with a report to the membership, which is an annual part of our charter. Afterwards, Dr. Komaroff will present his talk, and we will follow that with a 10-minute break and return for a question and answer session in which Dr. Komaroff will answer your questions. All right, so uh, that wraps up the housekeeping notes. Um, before we begin, we have a couple of poll questions to just get to know a little bit about you and, and who is attending today. So go ahead and answer these polls and, and we'll go through them in just a minute. All right, it looks like the majority of folks calling in today have been diagnosed with MECFS. Um, but we also have some long COVID patients on the line today, as well as patients that have been diagnosed with MECFS and long COVID. Um, and it looks like the vast majority of folks are patients, but it's really nice to also see some caregivers and some family members and friends. And uh, I love that there are also some medical professionals. So thank you to everyone who is joining us today. Okay, um, thanks for answering those polls. Now I would like to welcome Phil Chernin and Phil is the president of our association and he will provide a report to our members today. Phil is a longtime volunteer who has served in the past as director, treasurer, and over the past year, one of his many accomplishments has been in leading the effort to enhance our patient services program. So it's now my pleasure to turn it over to you, Phil. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is an honor for me to preside at what is our 38th annual meeting of the membership. So in the next 12 minutes or so, probably 15, I'll go over our history and mission, this year's accomplishments, the challenges we face in the coming year, and I'm going to be recognizing some of our incredible volunteers. In the beginning, our association was founded in 1983, incorporated in the state of Massachusetts in 85. It was a time when there was very little information available about the illness that we now know as MECFS. From mystery disease to chronic Epstein-Barr virus syndrome to yuppie flu, uh, our volunteers shuttled books and articles back and forth to homebound patients on foot by car, by US mail, there was no internet. Every article, VHS tape, tape or news mentioned was a huge event. The heart of the association was our network of support groups, where people met in person to share stories, resources, and help one another cope, a program we now have moved to the internet. We enjoyed a warm collaboration with our guest speaker, who is arguably uh, the nation's uh, most celebrated MECFS medical hero. Uh, Dr. Kamarov provided yearly updates to our members at our annual conference. It was a time, believe it or not, where Dr. Kamarov could not find an audience of fellow physicians who were interested in what he had to say. Boy, have times changed. Back in the day, we were a lone voice in the wilderness. Now we're part of a much larger ecosystem of international organizations, clinicians, researchers, government agencies, authors, journalists, and we're all at the crossroads between the past decades of medical neglect, the present crisis of long COVID, 
and a future that we are all working to make greener and brighter for millions of individuals suffering with post-infectious and related chronic illnesses. We have found ourselves to be serving a unique role in this landscape, a role reflected in our mission statement here. We support people living with MECFS and their families by connecting them to supportive resources and each other, and by educating and advocating to expand the MECFS healthcare and social service infrastructure in Massachusetts. A phrase I'd like to uh, highlight here is connecting them to supportive resources and each other. The support we provide is free. It's often deeply personal and confidential, and it makes a significant difference in the lives of hundreds of individuals each year. And you'll be seeing some uh, quotes, I believe, and comments from uh, people who have benefited over the last year. I'm happy to say that the association is in good shape. We've made good on all the commitments that we made at last year's meeting and much more. So let's have a look. We held 170 plus individual guidance and counseling sessions on disability determinations, health management approaches, and provider referrals. We added, I think, 12 to 14 healthcare providers to our referral database. We started support groups for young adults and seniors, and we held 18 open and free to all support group meetings attended by over 225 participants. We began a monthly applications of research discussion group that explores how current research can be used to guide an individual's discussions with their healthcare providers. This is regularly attended by 25 to 30 highly engaged patient, patient researchers and a big shout out to uh, volunteer Sharon Simis for the amazing effort she puts in uh, to prepare for and work with this group. And we began a evidence-based support group session, sessions facilitated by licensed mental health practitioners uh, including a special six-part art therapy program, eight-part life skills program, and a six-part coping with ME series. We launched our Sunday conversation series of monthly online discussion forums featuring expert speakers on topics ranging from how to navigate the disability determination process to Chinese traditional medicine and lots in between. Programs in which over 800 individuals participated I'll talk more about the group that put this on uh, later. We held private meetings with the director of the Beth Israel Long COVID Clinic to share information about MECFS. <clears throat> and these talks resulted in a new section on our website of MECFS resources specifically for long COVID physicians. We were honored to be the recipients of proceeds from an art exhibit to increase awareness of the needs and talents of individuals with disability. Thank you, Linda Morgenstern, for that wonderful gesture. Center in conducting two grand rounds, one for MECFS and the other for fibromyalgia, and we made many enhancements to our various social media and communications outlets. Awareness building was a significant element of our educational programming. The figure on the left shows the growth in subscribership on each of our platforms. This past year, we increased total subscribers by more than 30% to nearly 10,000. That's 10,000 individual subscribers on each of our channels. On the right, we can see the reach that our campaigns garnered this past year. More than 75,000 users accessed our website. Over 25,000 users watched videos on our YouTube channel where this event will be published. I'll, I'll dwell here for a second so that you can take this in. Okay, moving on to advocacy. Total of 52 members and friends met with representatives from all 11 of the Massachusetts congressional delegation and the offices of both of our senators. Ron Beluso, one of our board members, spoke at the annual meeting of the National Organization of Social Security Claimants Representatives to describe the obstacles faced by individuals with MECFS and to establish a dialogue to improve claim processing. 
Hala Sluss, another board member, met with Congressman Raskin and McGovern to introduce them to researchers Lisa Sellen and Anna, and Anna Gill. Their research at UMass Medical is well-funded by NH, NIH, thanks in part to a Ramsey Seed funding grant that they received years ago from the Solve MECFS initiative. This prize opportunity was skillfully orchestrated by volunteer Rifka Solomon. Other volunteers, Rebecca Redner and Jeannie Eisenstein, met with Congressman Jake Ockenclaus to discuss issues affecting seniors and to hand deliver to them information about pending legislation we're asking the congressman to support. And we ran successful recruitment campaigns for MECFS researchers at both MGH Brigham and Tufts Med. And yes, there's more. A big shout out to the intrepid Mary Dimmock, who led a consortium of seven advocacy organizations to get MECFS to be properly coded in the US version of IDC 10. And if we were in person, now's the time when everyone would jump up and, and shout and clap. <clears throat> Moving on to what is not nearly as glamorous, this year, we completed the transfer process for a large request from a past board member. Doing so enabled us to hire our first employee. In fact, we hired two, an administrator and a patient services coordinator. And for those of you who have worked with either Ellen or Ken or both, I'm sure you will be surprised at their part-time job status, truly. It seems they both work two full-time jobs. <clears throat> We also broadened representation on our board to include legal and research professionals. So we move to challenges. Um, I'm sure the big challenges on the screen are familiar to everyone here. We need more MECFS literate clinicians. We need to leverage advances we have made in understanding MECFS to stem the tide of long COVID and conversely, we need to ensure that MECFS patients benefit from advances made in understanding and treating long COVID. We need congressionally directed funding, and we need the general public to have a basic understanding of how severe this illness can be and to show compassion for those who suffer. And we're grateful for the work that the national organizations, uh, our partners are doing in these areas. <clears throat> As for us, our challenge is a bit more pedestrian. Uh, we need more members in order to continue to do our work. The more members we have, the more of a voice we have in our advocacy work. Size matters when dealing with politicians and the media. And since the bulk of our revenue comes from member dues and contributions, the stronger our balance sheet will be and the more opportunity there will be for folks to learn about the different ways that they can volunteer and help our uh, organization continue to serve those who are in need. While our stated mission is to improve the MECFS social and medical infrastructure in Massachusetts, we receive support and educational requests from throughout, throughout the United States and indeed the world uh, as evidenced by Karen's uh, interesting opening slide. <clears throat> I think we have uh, 20 countries, re representatives from 28 countries who are in our newsletter database. Uh, as noted earlier, there appears to be no other patient-run nonprofit entity that provides the kind of free one-on-one -on -one support and guidance that we do, and so we really can't turn anyone away. As shown in the pie chart to the left, less than 35% of our subscribers are in Massachusetts. That's some newsletter subscribers. That's where we really have the most address information. We see the same percentage breakdown in our support group participation and in our website statistics. So our reach is broad, our work is vital, and with the advent of long COVID, the demands are compounding. We are good at the work we do, but we have not been very good at turning subscribers into members. We only have 361 members. Uh, yes, that's not missing a zero. It's 361 
members who support all the work that we do. <clears throat> to sustain the level of service that we provide and to grow uh, our, our services to larger groups who seem to be coming, uh, we'll need to double our membership next year. And we'll need to continue to add three to 400 members each year until we reach a very ambitious uh, but achievable goal of 1,500 members at the end of uh, 2025. And if um, any of you who are not members are inspired by what you hear and see today, you can start our campaign uh, right now with a click of a link that somebody's going to put in the chat. Okay, um, I can't possibly thank all of our uh, volunteers, but I, I do want to um, highlight uh, three uh, people who have, have just done extraordinary work this year. Uh, firstly, uh, Charmian Proskauer, who, who many of you know and has served in many roles uh, with the association. And this year she uh, focused on putting together the Sunday Conversation series, um, which uh, has really been a fantastic uh, uh, program for us. Karen Dove, who is also on the Sunday Conversations group, uh, not only does most of the moderating uh, of our events, because she's so good at it, but she also uh, does direct patient service, uh, guidance, and counseling. And I'd also like to uh, to uh, highlight Rebecca Redner uh, with uh, Andrea Jolay. Uh, Rebecca has just turned our social media uh, world um, into a real um, healthy machine. And uh, she does awesome artwork and has just wonderful sensibilities. Uh, so thank you to Rebecca. And lastly, I'd like to recognize a very special volunteer, Bonnie Gorman. Uh, Bonnie is the founder of our association. Um, in 1983, after a severe acute viral infection that she thought to be related to her nursing service in Vietnam during the war, she set up the Massachusetts Epstein-Barr Virus Association, that is now us, to provide support, education, advocacy, and research. She worked actively with the association until 2003, when she had to step back after a motor vehicle accident. She's continued to work on our medical issues and committees since then. She's been a nurse and social worker for over 40 years and counting. She most recently has been volunteering at a COVID vaccine clinic and is closely following long COVID issues. It is to Bonnie that we give the honor of introducing Dr. Kamroth. So take it away, Bonnie. Hi, this is Bonnie Gorman calling, and I thank you, Phil, for your information. And we also uh, want to thank Tony Komarov. Uh, it has been 40 years since we started this organization. It's actually our 40th anniversary this year of the beginnings. And uh, we have to thank Tony Komarov for his dedication and commitment to MEC fits patients at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, and worldwide for at least the last 40 years. He's been seeing patients well before that. Uh, Tony has worked with our association, currently named uh, ME, uh, CFS ME, but it's also been called Yuppie Flu, the disease of a thousand names, chronic Epstein virus, et cetera. Uh, Tony has provided clinical care, education, research, and endless advocacy over those 40 years to our members. He has always been with us, and we thank him from the bottom of our hearts. And uh, we do uh, want to acknowledge that Tony has a worldwide influence on the future of MECFS. He's a national and international medical expert on the illness. He's also a persistent and respected public policy advocate for Massachusetts uh, and nationally uh, for the illness. He has persevered through thick and thin on protracted public policy campaigns over these 40 years endlessly the name change issues that have come up 
uh, sort of continuously uh, over those 40 years. And uh, he has been there uh, with us uh, on his advocacy as well as his clinical expertise. Um, so we do thank you, uh, Tony, and uh, it has been a wonderful journey over these last 40 years. And you've been with us, as I say, uh, through thick and thin. Um, and I would also like to honor you by uh, taking a moment uh, to present you with a community kudos board of gratitude. Uh, we compiled the short video for you and the link to the full kudos board will be shared at the end of the presentation. Well, that was a wonderful walk down memory lane, Tony. Um, and uh, we, uh, so many of us, uh, thank you for the, really the 40 years of exemplary dedication uh, to the issue. Uh, we wanna present you uh, with a certificate of appreciation um, for this. And here's a photo of the certificate itself, and that will be mailed to you. And again, from all of our hearts, uh, we thank you uh, for your continued commitment over this long period of time. It has not been easy or simple, and we do appreciate all that you have done. We look forward to your upcoming presentation. Thanks so very much. Well, thank you uh, to the association, to Phil and Bonnie and everyone else. I see a lot of names of folks that I know. <laughs> um, it, uh, it's not only been 40 years since the organization was formed, but 
probably about 40 years since the first time I uh, talked with you. Um, and as you can see from a couple of pictures of me that appeared in that uh, very, very nice tribute, um, there was more hair then uh, than there is now, but at least for the moment, the rest of me seems to be uh, intact. So we'll just keep our fingers crossed. Um, I'm going to uh, talk today about, about the emerging similarities between long COVID and MECFS. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, it was very interesting to me because I thought there was a possibility that it would leave in its wake additional cases of MECFS or an illness very much like MECFS. And in fact, Dr. Bateman and I in 2020 is just after the pandemic began, published a paper predicting that that might happen. And it, it obviously has. The question is, um, is there any good news in the bad news that so many people as a result of COVID are suffering similar symptoms? And that's what I'm going to try to address today. So let me pull up my uh, slides. So the topics I want to cover today are the different consequences of COVID-19, the similarity in symptoms, the similarity in underlying physical abnormalities, the size of the problem for society, a theory about what is causing the symptoms of both MECFS and long COVID, and as Phil did, uh, a list of the important unresolved questions. COVID, as you know, can produce different kinds of illnesses at different points in time. At the beginning, acute COVID can cause terrible illness requiring hospitalization. Less well known is that in the people who have recovered from acute COVID, even in people who were not very sick with acute COVID, there is an increase in a number of conventional diseases that is caused by the fact that the virus has caused injury throughout the body that makes the body more vulnerable to those diseases. What are some examples? This is a huge study. 73,000 people who had COVID compared with 5 million people who didn't have COVID. So uh, a study you can trust the numbers from. Heart attack rates in the year following COVID. This is in people who never had these diseases before. Heart attack rates, two times higher. Lung failure rates, four times higher. Diabetes, one and a half times higher. The risk of premature death, over one and a half times higher. And then there is the lingering illness characterized by fatigue, cognitive problems, pain, other symptoms that we call long COVID. So what about that illness? What are the symptoms of it and how do they compare with the symptoms of MECFS? This is a summary of multiple studies involving a quarter of a million people. Uh, and it shows that six months after COVID, a very substantial fraction have the symptoms, fatigue, pain, disordered sleep, dyspnea or shortness of breath, difficulty concentrating, uh, and reduced function uh, and reduced mobility and reduced exercise tolerance. Two years after COVID, just showed you six months after, two years after, still a lot of people who report fatigue, weakness, sleep disorders, palpitations, 
aching muscles. And to do the study properly, they compared how frequent those symptoms were in people who'd had COVID compared with people who had not had COVID, who have some of these same symptoms. And you can see the frequency in people with COVID is much higher than in people who never had COVID. How often does this lingering illness following COVID actually meet the case definition, the criteria for MECFS? One study estimates that it's about 13 to 25% of the patients. So not everyone with lingering fatigue and cognitive problems after COVID fully meets the case definition for MECFS, but many do. Now let's compare the symptoms a little more directly. Here I'm showing on the left column the symptoms in people with MECFS, and then in the right column, people with long COVID, LC. And as you see, and not surprisingly, fatigue, post-exertional malaise, headaches, sleep disorder, impaired cognition, problems with memory and attention, depression, you can read them all. They are all shared by both illnesses. And that's been clear really since, I would say, the early fall of 2020, before we even had a vaccine, it was clear, it was becoming clear to many people, myself included, that there was this illness that looked a lot like MECFS with many of the same symptoms. Only real difference is that with long COVID, problems of smell and taste, speech, and hair loss and rash are more common, more prominent than they are with MECFS. As for ability to function, there is a well-used instrument that measures functional status. It has eight different subscales. They're arrayed here in this slide. And the subscales, uh, the higher your score on the scub scale, your, the better your level of function. The point the slide makes as it compares healthy control subjects, which are in green, people with long COVID in orange, and people with MECFS in red, is that people with long COVID and MECFS have much lower functional scores than healthy controls, with one exception which is here under emotional health. There's really no difference in emotional health functional scores between long COVID MECFS and normal controls. In an illness, if MECFS and long COVID were caused primarily by emotional dis disturbances, as some people have argued, you would expect to see a lot better emotional function scores in healthy people compared with these two other groups. You don't see that. So there is clear impairment of function in both groups, very similar to one another. MECFS in general is a little worse than long COVID. What about, we're talking about MECFS and, and long COVID, but the fact is, there are other illnesses that are followed by a very similar set of symptoms. A lot of other infections, for example. We know that in many, but not all, people with MECFS, it all seems to have begun with an infectious-like illness. Respiratory symptoms, abdominal symptoms, aching muscles, fever, other symptoms, uh, long COVID obviously began with acute COVID, with an infection with a particular virus. But in addition to these two conditions, very similar chronically fatiguing conditions have been described following all sorts of different infections. Infections with viruses, bacteria, even protozoa. So following infections, at least certain well-documented infections, 
as well as COVID, you see lingering fatigue syndromes. You also see that, although I won't talk about it today, in some people following major physical trauma. The question is, do long COVID and MECFS, although they share many symptoms, actually have the same underlying biological abnormalities? Because there's no, you can have many different underlying abnormalities causing the same symptoms. Just because the symptoms are shared doesn't mean that they share the same underlying abnormalities. We didn't know anything about that, I would argue, until halfway through this year, 2022. But it's becoming pretty apparent that they share many of the same underlying biological abnormalities, as well as sharing many of the same symptoms. They have an infectious trigger. They share abnormal autonomic nervous system function, autoantibodies or a kind of autoimmune process. They both seem to have trouble making enough energy molecules. Both conditions uh, produce a, a hypometabolic state, including in the brain. They both produce oxidative stress, mast cell activation. They both apparently involve abnormalities of the gut microbiome and abnormalities on exercise testing and abnormalities of the way the small blood vessels function and reactivation of latent herpes viruses. And we, we can go, go on. There are a lot of abnormalities, not all. There are some that have not yet been reported as shared between the two illnesses, but many shared underlying abnormalities. So uh, there seems no doubt that there are these underlying measurable objective abnormalities in both conditions. The question is, uh, how do they lead to the symptoms and how do they affect each other? Because they, they do, many of them, affect each other. Oxidative stress, for example, can produce abnormal energy generation by mitochondria and vice versa. And inflammation in the body can affect both of these things. In other words, they affect each other, which means that if something happens to make one abnormal, it then can trigger a series of dominoes uh, that makes other things abnormal, which sets up vicious cycles where something gets worse and so something else gets worse, which means something else gets worse. It's a very complicated process that is going on in the body. Uh, but the good news from it is that if you could really reach in and intervene and stop one of those abnormalities cold, it might also improve a lot of the other abnormalities. So from a standpoint of a doctor or biomedical scientist, this is um, a biologically interesting problem. Now, what about from the standpoint of society. Should society, for example, be spending much money on research into this problem? After all, we're a medical research. We're afflicted with so many medical problems for which we don't have answers right now, all of which are in need of more resources to study them. Uh, is this a problem, as much suffering as it causes, that really is big enough for society to spend more research money on. Here are four recent reports from eminent economics organizations, the Brookings Institution, the CDC National Center for Health Statistics, household surveys, the National Bureau of Economic Research, 
and an analysis by two eminent economists, David Cutler and Larry Summers, former Secretary of the Treasury, former uh, head of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. What do they say is happening to the economy as a result of long COVID? 16 million adults in the United States appear to have post-COVID illness that is causing two to four million of them to be out of work because of it. That's 1.8% of the total civilian labor force. It may be that it is these people who are accounting for the fact that there are so many more jobs than there are applicants for jobs in this country, which is dragging on the economy. The annual, annual cost of foregone, foregone wages caused by this is estimated to be 170 to $230 billion. The annual cost of medical care and other uh, for these illnesses is another $544 billion. And the aggregate cost just to the United States over the next five years is estimated to be $3.7 trillion. That would be a hit to the economy as great as the Great Recession of 2008 nine and 10. So is it a big problem? Yes. Currently, it's also a big problem for the disability system. Right now, there are about 8 million people who are disabled and receiving disability through Social Security. If 7 more million develop disabilities from long COVID, which is a conservative projection, that nearly doubles the number of people receiving disability in this country. And that's gonna be a huge load for a system, the disability system, that has shrunk the number of staff and closed 67 offices over the past decade. What's happening by way of federal research? Well, the good news is that the government is spending much more money in the next year on long COVID than it has ever spent collectively uh, in the last 40 years. Over a billion dollars in research. That's a lot of money for any given topic in medical research. On the other hand, as the economists say, when you're dealing with a $3.7 trillion problem, it's not such a big deal to spend a billion trying to figure it out. NIH has assembled a multi-center national cohort of cases of acute COVID, about 20,000 adults, 20,000 kids. That is, I should say, it's assembling it. It hasn't, uh, they, they haven't all been recruited yet by any means. They're all being followed forward in time, prospectively, with standardized collection of clinical information, laboratory tests, and various biosamples. That's exactly what I think should need, needs to be done. They're going to measure the evolution of symptoms after acute COVID uh, and the underlying biologic abnormalities. And the hope is that what they learn about long COVID will have applicability to MECFS. My guess is it will. Now, how do the COVID virus and other microbes cause illness? And what are, how do microbes of various sorts play a role in long COVID specifically? Well, the obvious microbe is the virus that causes COVID in the first place, SARS-CoV-2. It's also becoming clear that latent viruses that lie asleep in virtually all of our bodies 
for all of our lives, like the herpes viruses, of which Epstein-Barr virus is one example, that these viruses also may be contributing to long COVID. And then lastly, there are all of the bacteria and possibly other microbes that live in our bodies all of our lives, uh, mostly in our gut. Our microbiome is what we call all of their genes collectively. All of these different microbes appear involved in causing long COVID. How do they cause the symptoms of long COVID or of MECFS? Now we're getting into theory that I'd like to discuss briefly. Uh, it's, I should say, an unproven theory, but it's a theory that's not out of thin air. It's made plausible by a lot of scientific research. And it begins with uh, this question. What do we feel like when we get sick? Like when you get the flu, what do you feel like? Why do you feel that way? And what chemical signals are causing you to feel that way? Think about the, those three questions. Well, what do you feel like when you get the flu? Fatigue, uh, greatly amplified by exertion. You have trouble thinking. You're achy and you don't want to move around much. You have a headache, poor appetite poor sex drive. Many people with MECFS use the phrase almost exactly. It's like having the flu, except that it never goes away. That's what we feel like. So what? why do we feel that way? This is something, by the way, if you look at your pets when they get sick, it's not hard to tell that they're sick. They're moping around. They're not that interested in eating. They're, they appear to be suffering the same symptoms that you feel when you get sick. This, in fact, this, these sickness symptoms and the behaviors that follow are found throughout the entire animal kingdom. So they've been preserved throughout evolution, and they've probably been preserved for a reason. What's the reason? Well, how do they change our behavior when we have those symptoms? We, we're much less active physically and mentally. We sleep much more. We eat and digest less. We have less sex. And as a result, we utilize a lot less energy. And that preserves the energy, the energy molecules that we have to fight the infection. That's why those symptoms that lead to that behavior have been preserved when we get sick because nature wants us to have as many energy molecules as possible to fight the infection. That's what the theory says. As I said, this is seen in most animals, even in vertebrates. It's preserved in the most primitive of animals. It's, an, it's a, a temporary response to injury and infection that focuses the body's energy stores on fighting the infection or healing the injury. And in people with post-infectious fatigue, the stimulus that triggers the sickness symptoms and behavior seems to persist. We'll discuss how that might be. The theory holds that the central condition that is triggering these ongoing symptoms is neuroinflammation or activation of the brain's immune system. The theory goes further to say that there are, in fact, some neurons in the brain. The the cells in the brain that do the thinking and feeling. Uh, there are neurons whose only function 
is to generate these symptoms when we get sick. A sickness nucleus or a sickness symptoms nucleus. In a talk at NIH in 2019, I postulated that this this group of neurons might exist in the hypothalamus, part, particular part of the brain. What does the theory say triggers this group of neurons, this sickness nucleus, to produce all of those symptoms? It's activation of the brain's innate immune system. The immune system, when it's activated, produces chemicals that it uses sort of to orchestrate the army of the immune system that goes into battle. And those chemicals, we know through scientific experiments, produce many of these symptoms that we experience when we get sick. In fact, they are <laughs> what is making us feel sick. What activates the brain's immune system? Well, an infection or an injury to the brain itself would do it. But what we've learned in recent years is so can inflammation outside of the brain in other parts of the body. When some other part of the body gets inflamed, like the gut, say, it sends signals through the blood and up nerves that head to the brain that activate the immune system in the brain. So in one person, some smolder, smoldering infection or injury of the brain or in other people, inflammation outside the brain, both can activate the immune system in the brain, which then triggers the sickness nucleus, which then produces the symptoms. So how could these three microbe causes of long COVID be producing those symptoms? Uh, viruses that are already in the brain that are reawakened by COVID, like for which there's evidence Epstein-Barr virus and some other herpes viruses could do it. So could an infection with viruses outside the brain through systemic inflammation. And if the virus alters the gut microbiome that leads to inflammation of the wall of the gut, that too could signal to the nucleus, the sickness nucleus in the brain, that, uh, that there was inflammation in the body and the symptoms result. So that's, that's when this model was first presented, it was pretty clear that, that these parts of it, that the viral infection of the brain or the virus producing systemic inflammation outside the brain, that that could do it. Uh, but what wasn't clear was, was there any such sickness nucleus? That was just a theory. However, whoops, in the last uh, several uh, months, really, there have been a series of papers in the most prestigious journals of biology reporting exactly these nuclei, a group of them, in the hypothalamus, in the brain stem, that at least in mice, we don't know yet in humans, but many things that are true of a mouse's brain are true of the human brain, uh, that there exist such nuclei dedicated to producing these symptoms. So that part of the theory at least looks a little less theoretical than it did several years ago. So in summary, uh, ME-CFS and long COVID have underlying 
biological causes. Um, in my opinion, there now should be no question about that. Uh, they, it, this includes the infectious agent that triggers some cases, all cases of long COVID, some cases of ME-CFS, uh, immune activation, neuroinflammation, autoantibodies, dysautonomia, which is abnormalities of the autonomic nervous system, oxidative stress, defective energy metabolism, hypometabolic state, and a pro-inflammatory gut microbiome. Secondly, these underlying abnormalities are all connected. They can reinforce each other. They can cause vicious cycles. They make it harder on one hand to fix the problem, but on another, they could make it easier if by absolutely shutting down one of these abnormalities, we could quiet the other abnormalities that talk to it. They probably cause the chronic sickness symptoms by stimulating a group of neurons in our brains, although in humans, such a group hasn't yet been identified. Uh, and those neurons are activated by inflammation in the brain or signaled to the brain from inflammation elsewhere in the body. The economic burden of long COVID and of other long-term uh, sequelae of COVID-19 just in the United States may be approaching $4 trillion over the next uh, decade. The number of people seeking disability could double over the next couple of years. The number of people meeting criteria for MECFS could also at least double. And fortunately, NIH and CDC have invested more heavily in research around this group of problems than they ever have in the past if the research on long COVID leads to answers for MECFS, which I am hopeful that it will, but time will tell. That will be good news for everyone. Uh, but as I look back over the first time I talked to this group, which was close to 40 years ago, I think about back then when there were a handful of people, really a small handful of people in the country, in the world, who were interested in the problem. I mean, people in the biomedical community. Uh, not very many people outside the biomedical community who had ever heard about such a problem or cared much about it. Uh, virtually no money spent on research into the problem. No knowledge at all of, at that time, 40 years ago, of any objective underlying biological abnormalities. In fact, doctors would often say to me back then, uh, but you know, there doesn't seem to be anything wrong, meaning that when I do all of the usual tests that I do in my patients, they all come back normal. So they would conclude that means there's nothing wrong. Well, the problem with that logic, of course, is if you're not ordering the right tests, then the fact that they all come back normal should not be reassuring. Um, but it has taken 40 years, but now what some doctors say to me is, well, there's nothing wrong. They don't say that anymore. Now they say, how, how can all of these things be wrong? Well, the answer is because they're all connected to one another because they all affect each other. When one gets worse, they tend to make the other things worse. And it's perfectly logical 
that so many of these connected things should be wrong. Uh, and they all, the good news is, they all offer targets for treatment. Because if you can target and shut down any of them, you have a chance of simultaneously shutting down other abnormalities as well. So today, I think back on, on a time when few people were interested in the problem and we knew nothing about it. And now 40 years later, uh, we know a good deal more. Do we know enough to cure it? No. I wish we did, but we don't yet. And unfortunately, there's a lot of diseases that we've known about for a lot longer than 40 years. We also haven't yet figured out how to cure. But I believe the way you figure out cures is through science. And scientifically, we know a great deal more today uh, than we did 40 years ago. So just in, in summary, uh, I think that uh, the advent of long COVID has had the very unhappy consequence of making a lot of more people sick with a chronic illness for which we don't yet have a definitive cure. But it has awakened uh, the recognition on many, many people that these kinds of post-infectious fatigue syndromes uh, are a very real thing with potentially huge economic consequences, that they're not limited to COVID and a handful of other infectious diseases that I talked about earlier, but if and when there's a next pandemic, as there certainly will be, there will be the problem with the chance with that pandemic for the same sort of residual chronic debilitating illness. So now is the time. 40 years ago was the time, but now certainly is the time to really get on top of what is going on scientifically with this similar group of illnesses, which likely share underlying biology and may share some common effective treatments to learn about them and figure out how they will help improve the health of everyone who has been forced to suffer with them. So I'll stop with that. Thank you again for inviting me to talk. 40 years ago uh, was a long time, but we're still at it. And um, we know a lot more than we did 40 years ago. That's reassuring. Thanks so much. I'll, after the break, we'll open it up for questions. Okay. Well, let me just start by saying, um... I've known you for an awfully long time. Uh, your talks are always uh, fantastic, but this one is a uh, chart topper. Um, oh, thank you. Yeah, it's uh, your ability to cover all these bases and all the gray space between clinicians and researchers and government entities um, and, and patients is just remarkable. So thank you so much. Thank you, Phil. So um, we have a boatload of questions uh, and um, my colleagues and I are doing our best to prioritize them. I'm gonna start um, with the following. Um, there, are, there are three uh, terms that are often discussed, at least in the, in the MECFS community, uh, only one of which you really hit on and they're kind of related. And, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about your theory uh, and how it relates to the vagus nerve and homeostasis. So hypothalamus, vagus nerve, homeostasis, how do these things relate to one another 
with regards to this theory you presented? Well, vagus nerve is the main signal that uh, inflammation elsewhere in the body, outside the brain, uses to send signals to the brain. So the vagus nerve is on one hand, the highway to the brain that alerts the brain that there is inflammation somewhere in the body. Uh, Mike Van Elsiker has also proposed that the cells that wrap themselves around, that some of the cells that wrap themselves around the vagus nerve could themselves become infected and inflamed and be a source of those signals that causes the brain's immune system to turn on and lead to the sickness symptoms. Uh, so I think the vagus nerve is um, absolutely a central part of the overall theory that I, that I presented. Homeostasis, um, harder for me to, to, um, to, to address. Uh, the, the autonomic nervous system maintains a homeostasis. What does homeostasis mean? It means when the body tries to do one thing, there is another part of the body that keeps it from going too far and quiets it down. And these two systems keep themselves in balance or supposed to keep themselves in balance. The autonomic nervous system, for example, one part of it, the sympathetic nervous system can raise blood pressure, but the parasympathetic part can lower blood pressure. And what you need is a well-modulated uh, crosstalk between the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems so that your pressure is going up when it needs to, but not too far. It's going down when it needs to, but not too far. Uh, and, and what happens in many people with MECFS and long COVID is that that modulation, that homeostasis, between the two arms of the autonomic nervous system becomes a little imbalanced. It's not as smooth. The, the blood pressure raising part may get too high before the part that's supposed to quiet it down kicks in to try to quiet it down and vice versa. So that's the one kind of homeostasis that I, um, that I can see as part of the, the pathology of MECFS. And the third term, Phil, remind me. Oh, you got them all. Hypothalamus, yeah. vagus nerve, and homeostasis. Yeah, okay. you covered the hypothalamus. So the, the question that most people are interested in is, is there any evidence that rehabilitation of the autonomic nervous system, which I, I suppose would be the res restoration of homeostasis to some degree, uh, can be uh, helpful or, in fact, curative? for people with MECFS? Well, curative, I would be a little skeptical about because that would imply that the dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system is the only thing leading to the symptoms of MECFS. Um, and I don't believe that's likely to be the case. Um, and I also, I'm no expert on autonomic nervous system function. I also don't know of any way yet figured out of restoring the balance, the homeostasis between the two arms. Um, but the, 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 the good news is that the autonomic nervous system experts who are, um, have been called into action by long COVID are also increasingly, uh, at least I hear from anecdotes around the country, seeing patients with MECFS and offering them treatments based on the autonomic dysfunction that help, don't cure, but help uh, with the symptoms. Okay. How about uh, moving to exacerbation of symptoms? Um, can you comment on, on post-exertional malaise and What's happening 
in the post-exertional malaise process that exacerbates symptoms. I apologize if you're hearing my dog bark. No problem. I like dogs. Um, I post-exertional malaise um, turns out not to be a temporary part of MECFS, but also a temper a, a permanent part of both MECFS and so far as we can call anything permanent long COVID. For at least two years, people who got long COVID continue to have post-exertional malaise. Um, does pushing yourself too hard, physically or mentally, leading to post-exertional malaise, make it harder for you to recover from MECFS or from long COVID? I don't know of any evidence that that's the case, if that's the implication of the question. Uh, my advice to people uh, always has been, as, as you can recall, um, that you should be very careful about how much physical exertion that you engage in. You should avoid, if you have either of these two illnesses, uh, it, it, you should avoid any activity that, that requires a really vigorous physical activity in a short window of time. Uh, because you may pay, pay a price uh, for the next several days, possibly longer. Um, on the other hand, I think there are many patients I've had who, if they're careful about it and engage in regular exercise programs that are slowly escalated or graded in increase, can feel better as a result of that. But some of them will have episodes of post-exertional malaise and, and, and stop the exercise for a month or two and then go back to it. There's no, it, there is a risk uh, to trying regular exertion, but it also improves how some people feel if they don't push themselves too hard. What's too hard? No doctor can ever define that for you. The wisdom of your body will tell you, uh, and it will be most, like most of life's lessons. The way you learn those lessons is to experience them and, and find out what you should not do the next time. Yeah, I appreciate that answer very much because, as you know, graded exercise is a, a trigger point for, uh, yeah. for folks because doctors who have no understanding of the illness sort of push patients. But in fact, uh, I certainly agree. Uh, and I've seen hundreds of times where slow increases in, in exercise are tolerable and lead to some improvement. I, yeah, I we just hasten to, to agree with you there. I, I want it to be clear that I absolutely do not support the doctor expert who tells you the solution to your problem is just to exercise more. Uh, and there are an embarrassingly large number of people who think that they're experts, but in this instance, don't know what they're talking about, uh, who have caused harm to patients. That said, uh, I am also not saying, oh, don't exercise. That'll be worse for you. You just got to be very careful about it and willing to pay a periodic price when you don't think you pushed yourself too hard, but at least today you did. Uh, and so you've got to back off for a while and then try again. That to me is the most reasonable thing. Thanks for the clarification. Um, you mentioned doctors who think they're experts. <clears throat> it, can you comment on, uh, there are a few questions here about who do I see? Is there a medical specialty that's going to own MECFS? Uh, what is a CFS expert? Can you comment on assuming we are able to educate physicians uh, much faster now than we have in the past. Uh, is there a type of physician that one should be searching for? Is there a medical specialty that you foresee will eventually own this illness? Um, and lastly, what is the role in your view 
uh, of the PCP? All very good questions uh, without, e without easy answers. Um, on one hand, what I've said today is that this illness involves infection, involves the brain and autonomic nervous system, involves metabolism, involves the immune response. And there are experts in each of those areas. And uh, for an illness that involves so many different kinds of abnormalities, you would almost hope that one specialty didn't own it because if they did, they would probably be have blinders on. They'd be very good at focusing on the part of your illness that they know a lot about, and they might ignore the parts of your illness that they don't know a lot about. Uh, my hope is that uh, PCPs, who after all care for most patients um, in the country longitudinally, um, will we'll become more knowledgeable about both of these illnesses. I agree with you, Phil, that the, the good news is that electronic technology has made it easier to get educated um, from the most knowledgeable people at a distance. Education can be done a lot more efficiently today than it could when, when I was starting out, for example. Dr. Bateman uh, at the Bateman Horn Center in Salt Lake City is organizing a series of continuing med medical education sessions for physicians, most of them primary care physicians, to, uh, to teach them about these illnesses using uh, streaming and podcasting and electronic technology that allows people to get educated at the moment that they have the time to be educated. The problem with traditional education is if the course is being given on Monday morning at 9 a.m. and that's it, and you just can't be there Monday morning at 9 a.m., you're out. Today, if a doctor wants to learn something at seven o'clock at night, uh, they can do it then. And if they have to stop halfway through to to take care of a child who's having trouble falling asleep, they can come back to it after they're done with their kid. Uh, it's much more easy to get the education uh, that you need. So uh, I'm hoping we still have a huge problem with not enough doctors in this country who care for either MECFS or long COVID patients and have long experience with it. I hope long COVID will generate a whole group of new doctors that know how to deal with long COVID and that the lessons they learn will apply to MECFS so they can help people with MECFS. But right now it's a bit of a mess because there are more people with both illnesses than there are doctors who have long experience with either illness. Okay, yeah, that's a tough one to, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, let me move on to um, biomarkers and case definitions. And there's a whole bunch of questions about, um, is it that important to have a case definition of MECFS now? How does it relate to what the case definition is of long COVID? Uh, is there some umbrella term people have, proposed PAPIS post something or other infectious umbrella term that, that needs some kind of uh, case definition or definition. But how does all of that, the need for case definitions and the use of case de definitions play into the current surge of funding at NIH and the studies that are being done? Are things going to be immediately translatable? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Um, and before the COVID pandemic, I would have said to you, I'm a, I'm a big believer in case definitions. Um, they're, uh, they're almost never right the first time around, and they almost always need to be amended over time as you learn more about, about a new illness. Um, but they're really helpful 
uh, in scientific research at making sure that the studies that are on a supposed disease are really apples versus apples comparisons. They're all talking about similar, the same patients. With COVID, my advice for what it was worth to the NIH was uh, rather than focusing on creating a case definition, what should be done and I hope will be done is being done with the COVID uh, funding, the recover study, is that what they all agree on doing is collecting exactly the same data, meaning the same symptoms and asking about those symptoms in the same way. So if someone says, I have brain fog, for example, what exactly do they mean by that? Are they talking about a problem with memory, a problem with paying attention, a problem with con confusion about the direction that they're supposed to be going in? I mean, it can, brain fog can mean a lot of different things. What do they mean? Um, and systematic collection of if physical examination is done, what parts of the physical examination and how is it done? And if people are looking to see if the liver is enlarged, how exactly are they defining that the liver is enlarged? And then lastly, all of the tests that are being done, that those tests be done in a standardized way, meaning the same tests performed in the same way by different laboratories. And then what that gives you at the end of the day is this huge database and then you can ask, well, we will identify some patients who seem to have gotten completely better from long COVID and others who have not. Now let's look at the database and see if we can predict who got better and who did not. Are there certain symptoms that make your prognosis worse? Are there certain laboratory tests that make your prognosis worse? Can we create case definitions by examining the data that we have systematically created after the fact and not worry so much about off the top of our heads creating a case definition at the beginning of the pandemic? That was my advice. I think, I'm sure it was not just my advice, and I, and I think that appears to be what they're doing. Okay, moving on. I can tell you from painful experience as someone who has participated in creating case definitions, looking back on it, I can see mistakes that those of us involved made in the elements of the case definition and in the name given to the, in, the illness as part of the case definition. Uh, and, you know, no, no one gets it right all the time. And uh, that's the problem with premature case definitions. Let's move on to treatments. Um, of course, there's a lot of concern, uh, frustration that Amplogen is being uh, retrialed uh, for long COVID. Uh, there's a lot of angst about the history of that with MECFS. Um, the, the question is, um, in general, can you comment about the, the likelihood that uh, long coat that amplogen will in fact turn out to be uh, either helpful or curative uh, in long COVID? And if so, uh, will that um, suggest that it be uh, helpful or curative with MECFS? And the other two medicines that are in common use that I, I'd like you to comment on are Abilify and low-dose naltrexone. Right. As for amplogen, um, it has been subjected to several randomized controlled trials, which are the way, in my belief and many people's belief, uh, you can establish whether a drug really is effective. And uh, those published trials have shown some benefits in, um, in the cardiopulmonary exercise test results, um, but haven't persuasively, at least to me, shown benefits in 
uh, symptom improvement and long-term prognosis. First of all, they've been short-term trials, uh, 12 weeks, 18 weeks, whatever. But this is not a 12-week illness. This is a long-term illness. And what all of us want to know is, is there any treatment that's going to fix this more or less permanently? And the amplitude trials don't tell us that because they weren't conducted for long enough. So uh, as to, I am delighted to know that amplogen is being uh, tried in a randomized trial in long COVID, because since I've told you, I th think the underlying pathophysiology, the underlying biological abnormalities of the illnesses are simpler, are similar, um, it could very well be there's a reasonable possibility that it would be helpful in long COVID, but I wouldn't prophesy what whether it will or not. I, I that's why you do the randomized controlled trial to get an answer that you can scientifically respect, uh, not a guess. Um, so that's that's all I'd say about amplitude. Maybe the one other thing to say about amplitude that I'm sure will make some people unhappy is that the there was evidence presented publicly at the an FDA hearing that I was a part of that some of the data that had been reported in the amplogen trials of MECFS um, was incorrect, which made me step back and say, oh, well, I wonder if the data that's been published might also be incorrect. Uh, so so uh, amplogen, it, uh, it's a wait and see proposition for me. Uh, low dose naltrexone. I have never used low dose naltrexone when I was in practice for 45 years, um, but everything I've heard from my colleagues who have used it and everything I've read about it its use in other illnesses as well, says to me it's, it could very well help some people and its potential if used properly to cause harm is quite small. So, so I've, uh, when people ask me which drug should, we, should major money be committed to to study in, law, in large randomized trials, I think low-dose naltrexone uh, is one of those drugs. And the third thing you asked me about was, oh, Abilify. Okay. Um, there is uh, Hector Bonilla's very, very small uh, but encouraging report. Um, and uh, I would, I hope that the manufacturers of Ambil Abilify will agree to fund a large study that's a randomized trial that will put that encouraging report to the test and find out if, if it really might be helpful. Okay, we're moving on to the Recover Initiative, which you, you commented on and um, uh, happily and surprisingly, there's a list of, of MECFS experts on the Recover site and, and you're one of them. Um, how important is that initiative? How much confidence do you have in it? Uh, is there a particular way that folks who would like to participate or engage with it, either to keep current or to participate in trials, should go about doing that? They, um, I haven't spent a lot of time on it, but they have a website and a regular email newsletter that do a pretty good job of keeping people abreast of how things are, are going with the study. Um, I was involved in discussions about the RECOVER program early on, but I'm not currently involved in monitoring the progress of the study and as part of any oversight committee, uh, partly by, by my own choice. There, I'm, I'm at an age where I can choose to spend my time on the absolute top priority things. And for me, the top priority are the studies of MECFS and long COVID that, that we're doing and not the recovery study. Um, 
it got off the ground slowly. Uh, I, I think it's sort of embarrassing that a, a scientifically uh, sophisticated nation such as ours, a wealthy nation such as ours, should commit to doing a study like the Recover study in February of 2021, when the pandemic and the cases of long COVID that were emerging from it were clear nine months before. And then committing in February, 2021, didn't really get the study going until late 2021. And it's behind schedule in terms of enrolling patients. Now, I, that's too bad. I don't want to minimize how hard it is to organize a study involving this many different centers and doctors and patients. Uh, it, uh, I feel for the people charged with doing it. But having said that, um, we're a nation that knew another pandemic was coming. And we should have been much better prepared not just to study long COVID, but to be prepared to develop rapid tests and vaccines and, and to be able to distribute those vaccines to everyone as fast as possible. We have not been very well organized in responding to this latest pandemic. And we're not getting, we're not doing the things that we need to do to be better organized for the ne next pandemic. That's my larger concern than the recovered study per se. I would hold it there. Thank you kindly. We're, we're sadly out of time. There are a lot of great questions that I wasn't oh. able to get to, um, but we've all been at this for a very long time and I'm sure some of them eventually will be answered. So I'm gonna turn it back to Karen uh, with my, my personal thanks and uh, take it away, Karen. I just want to say thank you again to Dr. Komarov for being an excellent keynote speaker today. And thank you to all of our guests and members and um, all of you for joining us today for the annual meeting. So just following up on a couple of things um, throughout this meeting, there have been a couple of links that were posted in the chat. So feel free to review the chat and visit those links. You can check out the CUDA board for Dr. Komarov, um, learn about how to become a member, and also there should be a link for an upcoming um, yoga class modified for MECFS tomorrow. I also want to let you know that our next Sunday conversation is coming up in November. We're gonna be bringing back the breakout sessions that we did a couple of months ago. So you'll be able to chat with other people in small breakout rooms over Zoom. And we will be talking about the theme of coping for the holidays. And um, it will be at the usual time and registration link will be coming soon. I also want to put in a plug for volunteers. As you can see from this slide, there are a number of ways that you can get involved with Mass MECFS and contribute in a way that um, uses your talents. And also you can contribute whatever amount of time you have. Uh, as Phil mentioned, many of the volunteers who help with this organization have MECFS themselves or fibromyalgia. And so um, every little bit helps. I also want to, again, thank you to our generous sponsors uh, for this meeting today from the Whittemore Peterson Institute, Music Go Round, and the New Jersey MECFS Association. Thank you so much for your support. And finally, uh, one more plug for the organization. Please do consider a donation to help support our programs and our valuable work. Thank you again for coming and we hope to see you again next year.